Hello, and welcome to another episode of Lion Wing Talks, uh, where we talk about all things Lion Wing. I'm Bradley Hailstorm. I am the host of this show. Uh, I just also happen to be the founder and president of Lion Wing Publishing. So Lion Wing Talks is a show that we do weekly, uh, every Wednesday. I think today's Wednesday. It's been one hell of a day, uh, so it could be a totally different day, and I wouldn't know it. Um, nevertheless, this is a show where I answer community questions and give updates on Lion Wing projects and just kind of shoot the breeze about all things Lion Wing, localization, uh, tabletop games, and Japanese tabletop games. So uh, I invite folks, if, if you're listening to this or you're watching this on playback, I invite you to join us live. There's always some kind of lively chatter happening in the uh, stream chat, and uh, it's a good opportunity to catch me in real time and to, uh, you know, catch me flat-footed with some questions that I can't prepare for. I try not to prepare for the questions too much anyway. I like to look at the questions that y'all ask in the Discord and social media and Kickstarter uh, pretty much right when I'm on the air. Invariably, sometimes I'll look at the questions because I have to transfer them over to my episode document, uh, my run sheet. But nevertheless, I do like to try to answer things uh, on the air and looking at those things for the first time. I think you just get a better answer that way. Um, and that way I can't prepare for it. That way I can't prepare some bullshit for you. So uh, I like to be as honest as I can with this stuff. So we, we've got a good show for you. Um, lots of questions today. Lots of questions came in through the Discord this afternoon. We were looking a little barren. Um, we were looking a little barren at first, and then all of a sudden the, the questions just started flooding in uh, around 2 p.m. today. So I appreciate everyone who jumped on the Discord, asked a question, some really good questions today. I mean, it's good questions every week, which is uh, fantastic. It's part of why I love doing this. Um, we also had some good some good chats in the Discord today. A lot of, uh, lot of community discussion, not necessarily about Lion Wing stuff, but just about tabletop stuff in general. Um, distribution models was the, the topic, the main topic on the docket today. Uh, lots of uh, opinions on uh, distribution models in the tabletop industry. Perhaps we'll get into that a little bit later today. I'd love to uh, comment on that. Um, but first, I want to go through some questions. So the format of the show, if you're tuning in for the first time, is I answer your questions first, and then we move into some project updates where I talk about all of the Lion Wing games that uh, we've got in the queue for you. And we've got some, uh, we've got some news that we haven't shared thus far um, to talk about today. So you'll be getting kind of an ex some, some exclusive scoops, if you will. And yeah, so questions, then project updates. And then if you have questions or in, and you're in the chat, just ask those questions whenever you want. Um, I will answer them as they come to me. So let's get going. So the first question that we had in the chat today uh, was this. What do you see as a current trend in board gaming these days? And is that something that affects your decision on what games you choose to localize? Yeah, so there have been some trends in the board gaming industry over the past couple years. There are What's been most interesting, though, is to watch the board game industry respond to the pandemic. So the pandemic, um, I mean, universally has been awful, right? For the board game industry, though, it, it's remained pretty unaffected by the pandemic when it comes to creators still producing work. Now, certainly parts of the board game industry have been... Um, you know, gutted. I mean, conventions are, are non-existent. So there's a huge chunk of the board gaming pie that's just not on the table right now. And I'm excited for the day when we can return to conventions, but the pandemic has has not given, the, not given us that option. Um, but the board gaming industry, by and large, outside of that and outside of retailers being affected, which those are two things that are seriously important. Um, but outside of that, the board gaming industry has continued to to remain strong uh, dare i say that the that if you just look at kickstarter and you look at the board gaming community on kickstarter it's almost like uh you know there's been more support for projects for designers for publishers um in light of the pandemic it's it's almost as if people recognize that a lot of these companies now have to they can't survive on conventions and convention sales anymore and so a lot of folks have turned to kickstarter to supplement that loss of revenue. And we've also seen uh, the board gaming community try to get into the subscription model. So I was just talking about this in the, in the intro. I was going to talk about it a little later, but I might as well talk about it here. That is a trend that I'm seeing. It's a fledgling um, trend, 
but it's something that I've been noticing for probably the past six months or so. I've seen more and more subscription-based stuff pop up in the board gaming uh, market, whether it's Plat Hat Games and their, their new subscription model as it pertains to Summoner Wars 2 or the second edition of Summoner Wars, um, or if it's something like Team Covenant, who's offering a subscription model for more competitive card games, primarily LCGs. Uh, but then there have been some other some other uh, publishers and companies that have taken to the subscription model in the tabletop role-playing game community, which I think actually is a probably is set up a little bit better for that kind of thing than traditional board games, card games, that kind of thing. Uh, but nevertheless, that is a trend that I'm seeing. I don't know how it's going to pan out for, for this industry. It, I mean, it, it seems anymore that if you do not offer a subscription model, um, not necessarily in the board gaming industry, but outside of this industry and other industries, including adjacent ones, it's it's very hard to survive. I mean, I think people are recognizing that, um, you know, to produce entertainment goods or media is an expensive thing in 2021. And it has been expensive for a long time. And folks are trying to figure out how they can supplement and feed the beast. And one of the ways to do that is to ensure that you've got a constant steady stream of cash. Um, you can't always be running Kickstarters. There's no conventions right now for us. And so I think people have looked at other industries and said, hold on a second, they're doing the subscription model thing. Maybe it can work for the board game industry as well. And time will tell if it's going to work. I'm not convinced it will. I am always open to folks trying new things in this industry as long as they're putting the customer first. I think if you're going to utilize a subscription-based model, it needs to be consumer-friendly and consumer-oriented and puts the the needs and the 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 proverbial pocketbooks uh, of the customer front and center. If it's if it's um, if it's a shady model that is meant as a cash grab and is not um, respectful of the subscriber's wallet, then I don't think uh, that will. I don't think that'll pan out well. I don't think that'll survive, and it's just sort of shitty practice. But you know, done well, it could work. It, it, it could. Um, I'm not sure folks who show up for board games, though, are really looking to get into the subscription market. Certainly, there will be some folks who will, um, and there will be some folks who don't. You know, I, I was just looking at an ad, actually, that popped up on my Facebook. Um, I, I, I was just looking at an ad that popped up on my Facebook a couple of days ago from Plat Hat Games for their Summoner Wars 2E stuff, and... Uh, and in that ad was a mention of a subscription service. So I clicked on the comments because, of course, like the, the thing you always want to do in life is read the comments of an ad on, uh, in Facebook. Um, but nevertheless, you know, there were some pretty there were some pretty uh, loud voices who were vehemently opposed to it. And then there are, you know, plenty of people, probably just as many people saying like, OK, cool. Yeah, I'm, I'm down with this. So uh, that is it. Time will tell how that pans out. I'll talk more about it perhaps in another episode. Um but yeah, so that's a trend that I'm seeing. Um, I, Real beans, I have not answered the question about, about my Berserk shirt yet. I will get to that, though. Definitely, that's on my list of questions. Um, other trends that I'm seeing. So um, I think since the pandemic and before this, it's not like the pandemic initiated this or anything, but I think it, the pandemic has probably brought it a little bit clearer into focus, and that is you know, cooperative games are really doing well right now. Cooperative games have been doing well for a long time. Everyone loves a good um, dungeon crawl or a, co a cooperative romp through some kind of um, some kind of boss battle or, or a legacy system, something to that degree. Uh, so co-opers continue to be a trend. I won't say, you know, they, they're starting to be a trend. They've been a trend for a long time. And, I, and I, I'm not seeing any signs of it slowing down. Um, legacy systems, when I'm talking about cooperative systems, I, you know, immediately think about like legacy systems and legacy games and, you know, legacy games have been, uh, a big thing for a while now. I also don't see that going anywhere. I mean, certainly there, there were legacy games long, 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 long before Gloomhaven, but it was sort of like one of those Final Fantasy VII moments back in the nineties where, you know, prior to Final Fantasy VII, RPGs were a thing. There were plenty of RPGs and plenty of people played RPGs, but Final Fantasy VII came out at the right time, under the right conditions, um, with the right gameplay and the right look, and it brought in this whole new group of folks who maybe had checked out RPGs from the sideline but never really engaged with them, or it brought in new players entirely who never thought they wanted to play an RPG but said, hey, who's the spiky-headed dude? This looks pretty cool. Let me give it a shot, and then they fell in love with it. it sometimes I compare Gloomhaven to that moment there where I think there were plenty of people who 
were aware of co-opers in the board gaming market who had said, oh, yeah, maybe I'll try one of those one day, but nothing's really grabbing me right now. Just as I think there were people who were like, I never want to play a co-oper. And then Gloomhaven came along and they're like, actually, I want to play that co-op. And then they played it and it was sort of like one of those gateway drugs of, all right, that was awesome. Where can I get more of it? And, um, and even just people in my own life, I, I've noticed that has been a trend. Uh, their, their gateway was Gloomhaven, and now they're going back and exploring things like Descent. Um, so co-op continues to be a trend. I mean, you know, minis games continue to be huge. I, I'm starting to think that maybe the board gaming industry is eventually going to be um, taken over completely by miniatures games one day. Um, I, I, it's not that I'm against miniatures games. I love miniatures games. I have plenty of miniatures games. Um, but, you know that trend continues to be pretty dominant. Um, very dominant, actually. Um, so that's that certainly continues to be a trend. Uh, something that I've seen really take hold since the pandemic have been solitaire games and quick, small form accessible games. I think quick, small form accessible games have found their footing recently for a couple reasons. I think small form games in general are doing really well right now and will continue to do well. As more and more board games come out, I think players realize, hey, I only have so much physical space in my house, on my shelf. I can't keep amassing all of this cardboard and I can't keep buying all of these massive boxes. Um, and so it's time to downsize my collection, not literally in terms of like, you know, hawking their games and selling them off and, and trying to get out of the hobby. But I think people are saying downsize, like literally downsize the size of their, of their games so that they can make room for more games. And so I think uh, small form games are on the rise right now, if for nothing else than for space reasons. But also, you know, in the pandemic, what we've seen happen is because people have been in quarantine, They've wanted to play board games, but they can't meet up with their friends, their friend groups or their social groups. So they are recruiting people in their households to play board games with them. And a lot of those folks in those households outside of the person who owns the game maybe doesn't play board games very much, if at all. And so if you're trying to impl if you're trying to introduce someone to board games uh, and get them kind of invested in the hobby or at least playing them casually with you you probably don't want to start with the gloom havens of the world. Instead, you probably want to start with something that's small that you can teach in five to 10 minutes and with games that last anywhere between 15 and 45 minutes. You don't want to be stuck behind a three hour worker placement game. You don't want to be stuck behind a legacy system game that really only gets good four sessions in. And so I think those small form, quick and accessible games are really on the rise right now. And I, and I think that'll probably continue to be a trend even as we exit the pandemic, as much as we can exit the pandemic right now. I think we'll continue to see that be a trend because I do think that the hobby in general is just sort of growing. It's been growing for, you know, five, six, seven years, but that growth I think has been accelerated in the past two to three years and seemingly has been accelerated um, in lieu of the pandemic. So that's a trend that I'm seeing. Another trend that I'm seeing is not necessarily as a, a, like a, a board gaming trend, but it's a larger tabletop trend. And that is tabletop role-playing games are doing extremely well right now. They too have sort of caught fire over the past um, probably three years. Um, and I think the pandemic has probably accelerated their growth as well because it's much easier to play a tabletop role-playing game through distanced means than it is playing board games. I mean, people have been playing on fantasy grounds and, you know, Roll20 and whatever other, just through Skype, they've been playing tabletop role-playing games through those means, virtual means, for years now. And so I think people realized with the pandemic, hey, I w maybe this is the right time to get into tabletop role-playing games because I want to be able to engage with a tabletop property. I can't play a card game or, or a board game in the way that I normally would because I'm not seeing the folks that I would typically play those with. What is another avenue that I could explore here to still engage with the hobby that I love so much? Oh, hey, maybe I'll try out D&D &D or Pathfinder or I'm just grabbing the two biggest ones that come to the top of my head. I mean, at this point, there are countless RPGs. So I think we're seeing tabletop role-playing games really uh, hit a boom period again. Tabletop role-playing games, I think, are a little different than board games in that board games have had less of an ebb and flow over the course of their life. 
it's board games i think have been more kind of on a on a single shot trajectory where tabletop role playing games seem to phase in and out of popularity right now i think i i, I don't know if we're at the height of tabletop role playing game popularity but we certainly are in one of those peak periods as opposed to a valley period so those are some trends that i'm seeing uh, something that I'm not seeing anymore that was really big a couple years ago, and I mentioned this before, is worker placement games. Uh, it's so weird. You know, worker placement games, I feel like three years ago, about 18 worker placement games launched on Kickstarter every week. And now you don't see many of them at all, probably because we all have about a thousand worker placement games right now. That's not to say that there's not room for worker placement games in the market right now. There totally are. But I think people feel a little burned out by them maybe like they've gotten their fill of them for a while so worker placement also kind of in a valley right now but you know all of these things uh, all of the, uh, what genre is in and what genre isn't in it's it's just sort of the nature and the flow of the business sometimes things are not in fast forward a year two three and they're in again so it's just like almost with any sort of pop culture trend is you have high periods and you have down periods. And, and I think that is definitely true for genres within uh, the board gaming scene. I haven't been monitoring the chat here, so let me uh, see if I've missed any questions or anything like that. Um, okay, yeah, no particular questions, though some good conversation happening about co-ops and Gloomhaven and that kind of thing. Uh, some uh, Ray Lancer in the chat did say co-ops make good solo games. Um, I'm starting to appreciate solo stuff more often, or more, yeah, so, I love a co-op game that offers, you know, a solitaire variant. I mean, even if I have to play a, a co-op game and I have to control all the characters that, you know, let's say it's a it's a four-player co-op game where you can play it solo. You just have to control multiple characters. I'm fine with that. I know some people hate that. They just want to be able to, if you're playing solitaire, I just want to be able to control one character. I'm fine with that too, but I actually kind of like the party management aspect of playing multiple characters it makes me feel like i'm playing a jrpg and if you've heard me talk about anything in the past you know that i love jrpgs and so it it gives me those vibes a lot and so i actually like that style of solo play though i certainly know it's not for everyone i know some people just simply will not play uh, a solitaire game if that's the setup and, and i respect that to each their own i just happen to like it a whole lot um, but yes i do agree co-ops do make good solo games and i think a lot of people are getting into solo games right now if for nothing else than out of necessity they still want to engage with board games and one of the ways to do that is okay i'll just play by myself and so um i love seeing solitaire games take off uh, i mentioned this in episode one or two uh, that at one point in time, I remember being made fun of for playing board games solo. And now, you know, it's it's very much more normalized these days than it was just just like two years ago, three years ago. So it's great. It's great seeing publishers, designers and players sort of embracing the notion of, hey, it's actually pretty fun to just sit at the dinner table by yourself or wherever you play games and just engage with a physical product on your own. I, um, I love sitting down with a great solo game and a beer and just, you know, killing three hours, pouring over card text and uh, trying to compete against uh, the AI. I think a good solo game, you know, a solo game is only as good as its AI system though. And so there are plenty of games where you can tell the solitaire mode was sort of tacked on at the end. And those aren't very fulfilling, and those are not necessarily the ones you want people to check out if they're just getting into solo gaming. But there are plenty of games out there that offer robust solitaire experiences, and those are the things that really excite me. All right, so just checking the chat here. Okay, so next question that I, that I got today I know this is a broad and maybe dumb question, but are crossovers in games you have localized a possibility? So that is not a dumb question. That is a great question. And crossovers ultimately just come down to licensing agreements and paying royalties. Now, it, it makes a lot of sense and is much easier to, to cross over various games that you've published and that you actively have a licensing contract for because you can typically in those licensing contracts, there's almost always some sort of um, item that states that 
any use of the license outside of the game will incur an X percent royalty. So that might be that might mean that if you want to make a shirt with the game that you published uh, on the shirt, well, you're going to pay an X percent royalty to the designer. That's what that means. And so the the same is off is often and also true for uh, for utilizing characters from a license in other games. Now, certainly because you are using one character from one game in another game that belongs to a different design group, you certainly want to run that by all designers to make sure everyone's cool with it. Where you rarely, if ever, run into problems is if you tell you know various design circles that, hey, we're creating a game, we're designing a game of our own, and we want to include various properties um, that we have the licenses for, would you be open to that? Almost everyone will say, well, yeah, that's even that's greater exposure for our game and therefore our brand, so yeah, let's do it. Where it gets a little trickier is if, I'll take Testament and Wild Hunt Festival, for example. It gets a little trickier if you, if you say, you know what, I want a Wild Hunt Festival character to appear in Testament. That is slightly different because then you're taking a character from another property and you're putting it into a property that already exists and it's a property that belongs to someone else. It depends on the designers though because some designers are very fluid and are very open to you using their work in whatever you want so long as you just kind of like pass it by them and say, hey, is this cool? So for example, Kuro, uh, the designer of Testament and then of course the designer of uh, a number of other games that we haven't published but plenty of people know like Unicornus Knights, um, he is very loose with his properties. He he has that sort of attitude of like, hey, if you if if you pay me a royalty on it, sure, <laughs> use my stuff for whatever you want, run it by me. Um, but I'm always almost always going to say yes, and as long as you pay me for it, I'm cool with it. Uh, so he, he's sort of like the ideal designer that you want to work with, someone who's very relaxed and is open to those types of ideas. I haven't really worked with too many designers who I think would be against that kind of thing. And in fact, I would love a good crossover. I talked about my love for Super Robot Wars, I think in episode one, which is a huge crossover franchise. Even um, even something like Project Cross Zone, and maybe I'm dating myself back to 2013 on the 3DS, which was uh, a, a great crossover RPG. I love that kind of thing. And there's plenty of other crossover franchises i mean just grab like any mobile <laughs> grab like any mobile game and you've got crossover franchises you know like crazy I, you know i play a lot of grand blue and there's crossover events all the time um you know i've got street fighter characters in my grand blue i've got you know soccer wars characters in my grand blue so um so crossover things are not unusual you know for for designers and creators and i think most of them welcome that kind of thing because it is it's just it's another extension of, of marketing. And so most of the time, that's a good thing for a designer. Hey, you see my character in a game that you're playing that isn't my game? Well, that's great because then you might say, hey, what is, where does this character belong? And let me check out that game because if that character is in this game, there's probably going to be some crossover appeal for me. Uh, no pun intended. So let me check that out. And then the next thing you know, they buy that game. And so the designer of the, of, of the character who lets you uh, use that character in another game ultimately gets a gets a sale they get a they get a new customer they get a new fan so i think everyone wins in that in that situation i definitely would like to feature some i would i would like to do something with our various franchises because i think we have a lot of franchises that would make sense to appear together in unique ways um yeah, exceed gun and gun. Yeah, bullet gun and gun. Uh, someone was talking about level ninety nine, gun and gun wingspan expansion win. Uh, yeah, we'll get right on that. I'll see how those. I'll see how those two th themes make sense together. I, I'm I'm picturing Habana riding upon uh, an elegant winged beast, uh, firing uh, an incandescent shotgun in one hand and a revolver in the other. Makes sense. I could see it. Another question. Here we go. Can you discuss where you got your berserk, for, your berserk shirt from uh, in the last stream? Yes, uh, I got it from Atsuko. Uh, I think it's just Atsuko.com. They have a variety of licensed uh, anime shirts. Uh, berserk is one of those licenses. And uh, there are, if I remember correctly, there are several Berserk shirts. 
Uh, so that was the one that I liked the most. So definitely check them out. I, I think they're a relatively small and new company. So always great to promote and support an up and coming company such as Atsuko. Uh, Sin Theory in the chats, uh, this was about crossover franchises, said I def feel that uh, like the universes of the games you all localize in Easter games lend really well to crossovers compared to Western games. Yeah, you know, I think that there's a thematic parody. Um, that's parody with an I-T-Y, not an O-D-Y. Um, I think there's thematic parody a lot of the time with Eastern games, and perhaps it's just the aesthetic. Maybe it's just the, the art direction, the art style that allows two disparate franchises to feel like they could exist together as opposed to Western games where you, you probably get far more um, artistic diversity because you look at something like Wingspan, and then you compare it to something like Dominion, and then you compare it to something like, um, I don't know, take any Fantasy Flight property. I mean, they all look pretty different, and I can't imagine those things like ever combining. It just wouldn't it wouldn't make any sense. I mean, you can do it. You can make any crossover work. I think people expect that there's going to be a certain degree of suspension of disbelief when you're combining various franchises that are not meant to go together. But at the same time, you do want sort of like a through line with it all for it, for it to make sense. And you as the designer have to figure out a way to make it make sense of why all of these characters are existing in the same universe when they didn't before. Now, most of the time you get some sort of convoluted, you know, uh, storied plot device to, to get everyone into the same, you know, proverbial room. Uh, usually it involves some sort of like uh, parallel dimensions, time travel, that kind of thing. And most of the time, if you think about it too hard, you know, none of it fucking makes sense. Uh, but as long as you give someone like a slight story to believe in, I think most people are willing to kind of go where you're leading them and not think too hard about why these various franchise characters are teaming up when they don't exist in the same universe at all. Someone said, wait, Dominion has a theme? <laughs> Indeed. Fortnite crossovers. Yes. Uh, it was weird seeing Master Chief promoted on the PS5 home screen. Yeah, so, I mean, yeah, crossovers are a thing. I think I, people like them. People like them. You don't see it a lot in board games, so there might be an opportunity there uh, to kind of shake things up a little bit and do something that you don't see a whole lot in our industry. I think... We've got some franchises that make sense together. I think Testament and Wild Hunt Festival could be really fun. I mean, the, the art styles the art styles don't gel. I mean, they, they have the, the same s sort of like a thematic setting that they're both these fantasy world worlds and there's magic and there's swords. And, but that's kind of where the similarities end. I still think you can get away with it. Plus, I think it'd be really cool to see a Wild Hunt Festival uh, character represented utilizing Testament's template and its card formatting and seeing various skill cards illustrated utilizing someone like, you know, um, Monad or something from Wild Hunt Festival. I think it'd be really cool. So I think it, it, it could work. The next question, what thought processes go into deciding a game to localize? So I've mentioned this before that I mostly just localize games that I like, and then I hope that other people will like them too. So I like to pick games that I want to play in English and that um, exist officially in, in an English capacity. You know, there are plenty of fan translated games in the world and in, in, in every medium, and that's all great. I think, you know, fan translation communities are a, a boon to whatever community that they're part of, be it video games, or tabletop games, or role-playing games, et cetera, et cetera. But I do like something to be official. And so if I see a game and I'm like, you know what, I, I want that to have an official release because I like this game myself, then that's going to be something that I pursue. So at the same time, you know, it's it's sort of like balancing on the edge of a knife. You, I have to, I yes, I want to make sure that I'm, publishing stuff that I like because if I don't like something then I'm not going to get behind it I'm not going to believe in it I'm not going to do a good job marketing it um, I'm not going to care about it and I need for me knowing how I work I need to care about something 
to really get into it. I can't like fake it to make it. That's not me for better or for worse. There, there are times in my life when I wish I had that personality quality to me, and but it's just not there. So if I don't care about something, it's very obvious. And so I have to, I personally have to like the game, but I also have to balance that with is, are other people going to like this as well? And so with a, for a small company such as Lion Wing, you can probably get away with publishing a game, one game, that doesn't have much success. But probably only one game. Because if you do that more than once, I mean, maybe you could do it twice. But if you do it more than one time or two times, um, th then you're probably going to go under. I mean, Lion Wing is, is a it's a niche company. I mean, we, we have a small corner of this industry that not a lot of folks visit. And there's not a lot of folks in this corner doing what it is that we're doing. You know, there's a handful of other companies, really two, um, and one that is m more dedicated to the, to the mission that we have. But even still, both of those companies, like if you look at Level 99 and you look at Japanime, we're all sort of in the same corner, but they also design their own stuff or they will, you know, um, hire out or do an, an internal design for games. We only localize. We don't do our own stuff. That's not to say that we won't do our own stuff. Um, I do have something cooking that I've had cooking for a number of years that I'd like to do something with, but the timing isn't right. And so right now I can only talk about what we've done. And right now all we've done is we've localized and published other people's works. So we are even more limited than perhaps those two companies, which means that we can really only absorb, you know, one, one failure of, of a publishing deal. We can only have one game that fails because anything more than that, I, you know, can, can lead to financial ruin for the company. So I have to find this balance of let me make sure I'm finding games that I believe in and let me make sure that those same games are going to find some sort of audience here. I don't need a huge audience. I've never needed a huge audience for any Lion Wing product. I knew when I created the company that I was probably not going to have a huge audience, especially three years ago when, when Japanese games and anime-centric games were even less common. That They're growing in popularity, which is fantastic, but back then there was definitely this clear understanding that I am dealing in niche goods um, and there is a small audience for this. But I knew that I didn't need a huge audience. I just needed a, a small audience, but a dedicated audience who loved this stuff. And so I need to make sure that the games I produce, they're going to like, and I need to make sure that the games I produce are games that I like. The two have to sort of be symbiotic in that regard. So that's typically how I find my process for for finding you know a game to localize all right i also i would also say that i look i do look at those trends of where is the market right now um you know i was talking about this on a last episode or the episode before that i was talking about kuro stuff and someone had asked about Renaissance of Alchemy, which is a worker placement game, kind of a, a spiritual successor to Ars Alchemia that um, TMG published a couple of years ago. And it's one of those things where I initially was super interested in the game and I got really far along in planning for that licensing deal and then ultimately decided not to pull the trigger on it, primarily for two reasons. One is I had the thought of, well, people already have Ars Alchemia. And while this is a spiritual successor and does a lot more in its gameplay, and I think has a more robust gameplay experience than Ars Alchemia ever did, people might still feel like, well, do we really need a follow-up to Ars Alchemia? Like, we've already got that game. I don't know if we need a second one, even if the second one is vastly different. I think there will still be the, the link in people's heads of, well, this is a sequel, even though it's not, and therefore, do I really need that? in my life? Do I need to purchase that when there are so many other games to purchase? And I ultimately answered that question with, I think people are going to say, no, I don't need to purchase that game. And so that was the reason why I didn't pull the trigger. But the other reason is, well, worker placements aren't in right now. And so I'm not going to publish a worker placement game when 
the worker placement genre is is in a valley right now and not on the upswing and not at a peak. So uh, I do consider trends in what's happening right now. In fact, so our next two Kickstarters were originally going to be swapped. The Kickstarter that we've got coming in the summer was actually going to be our fall Kickstarter. And then our, our now our fall Kickstarter was originally going to be our summer Kickstarter. But I swapped the two because of sort of surveying the landscape and saying, all right, hold on, there's, there's a trend here. And we need to make sure we, we are riding that trend uh, because we're, we're, we're going to be releasing these games that the trend is, is indicating is a trend right now. Why wait on that? Um, so trends are important. And I think those are sort of the, the three things that I look at when I'm looking at, you know, what games I should, Lion Wing should localize. The next question, what made you guys decide to work with Japanime Games on Testament? It's the only group project you guys have done, and I was wondering what led to you deciding to work with another company on it. Yeah, so Testament. I got to back up a little bit. So before Testament, we, we released Sinoma Coliseum R back in uh, 2018, but we didn't fulfill uh, Sinome until April of 2019 and didn't finish fulfillment until we didn't finish fulfillment on that game until May. So we started work on Testament in 2019, but at that point, we were also dabbling in localizing and publishing uh, PC games. And so my, my efforts were split a little bit between the tabletop industry and the video game industry. And so concurrently, what was happening behind the scenes at Lion Wing is Lion Wing was still very much so a side project for me, um, you know, I had a, I had a, I had a day job. I was a clinical director at, at a addictions and mental health facility. And that was kind of my, that was my main job. And then line wing was something that I did on the side. Um, you know, it was sort of like a, a passion project or a passion company in many ways. And, uh, and I didn't pursue it with, you know, a ton of seriousness. It was, it was the quintessential like second job. I loved it. But my, my main focus was on my day job. And so we were working on Testament and it just hit me one, t- it hit me one day of like, you know, I don't know if, I, if I'm ready to publish a game the size of Testament on my own. So Testament uh, was an expensive game. Um, I mean, I think the ask for Testament was 25,000, but that's, you know, that's not the, that's not the final price. It never is on Kickstarters. The, the base funding goal is never the real goal. You know, it's always higher than that. Sometimes it's a little higher. Sometimes it's a lot higher. And so I, because I hadn't been pursuing Lion Wing 100% because I couldn't, because my time was effectively split between it and my, my day job. I knew that um, I was going to need help. I knew that I was going to need the marketing help. I knew that I was going to need help when it came to covering, you know, the printing cost and all the costs that you incur when you're publishing a game on your own. And I actually don't even remember how I got in contact with with Eric, Eric Price at Japanime. I don't remember how, but I did some I did some way. And then I drove up to Gen Con that year. So this was 2019, August of 2019. I drove up to Gen Con to meet with Eric. We set up a time to meet and I talked with him for like 40, 45 minutes about Testament and some other stuff that was happening at that time. And from that meeting, we both decided that, Hey, let's talk further about Testament throughout the fall and see if it's something that makes sense for both of us. I think at that time, Eric was, tr- was just beginning to, you know, really wanting to diversify his catalog of games from being sort of a, you know, um, a waifu deck builder company to something that had, not that there's anything wrong with either of those things. Those things are fantastic, but I think he genuinely wanted to expand out a little bit and Testament was a great way to do that. He had already worked with Kuro, um, at least once, but I think a couple of times. Uh, I can't recall Japanime's entire catalog of games, but I think he probably worked with Kuro a couple of times. And so I think he felt confidence in the product. 
And uh, with with our background and my background in localization, I think he felt comfortable with us being a localization studio on it. And we eventually settled on, well, why don't we just do this as a co-publishing thing? It makes sense for both of us. Um, we'll both bear the responsibility of this game. And that made sense for the time. It made sense for where Japan Anime was at. It definitely made sense for where Lion Wing was at. And again, I'm just I'm making some assumptions about Eric's mindset. I'm, um, but, you know, I don't know for certain these things. I'm just... Um, assuming based on our on our interactions and we had a lot of conversations as you would imagine we would leading up to a kickstarter of a game asking for twenty five thousand dollars um not that that's a huge amount but it's also not a small amount and so you know we worked together quite a bit and so i i think that's kind of what was going through his head and it's that's certainly what was going through my head at the time and i'm glad we we partnered with him i mean um, I like Japan anime. I like the folks there. I like their stuff. Uh, I like their mission. Uh, hopefully, uh, I didn't just lose the stream there for a moment because I think I had a internet connection instability message pop up on my screen. But nevertheless, um, so uh, I, I liked I liked working with them. It was easy. They were super nice. They understood. They understood Testament. They understood what I wanted to do with Testament, and they really gave us the freedom to kind of do whatever we needed to do with it. And in many ways acted as kind of the money uh, behind that project. And that's exactly what I was looking for and what I needed. Uh, Ray Lancer. Okay. Yeah. You said, did I lag? No, uh, you didn't lag. I lagged. So I don't know all, I don't know what you all missed on the stream you, on the playback. You probably didn't miss anything. Um, but nevertheless, so the, the partnership just made a lot of sense for us, and I'm glad we did it. Uh, obviously, the, the the shipping delays and whatnot have been less than ideal, but that has that wasn't Japan Anime's fault. Um, that's just you know that's the the state of the world right now. We, there are many things you can blame on the pandemic, and that sh that shipping delay was one of them. I mean, we did have some slowdown with uh, with getting some of the components just right. The uh, uh, the the tray, and then the um, the first player token, the 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 flame token, slowed us down a little bit. I think that slowed us down more than we were anticipating. I can't exactly put like a number on how long that slowed us down, but that did get in the way of things. I mean, you never know what's gonna like fuck up the process of production. Sometimes it's the smallest thing. Sometimes it's the stuff you don't anticipate being the thing to mess up, and then you know because you didn't plan for it, that's the thing that like totally derails your project. And I don't, you know, I don't think Testament ever got to the point of derailment. I wasn't involved you know, in the production hands-on. So I can't say for certain, but, you know, I mean, knowing how these things work now, I, I, Testament wasn't derailed, but certainly it was slowed down by a number of things. The pandemic obviously being the big one and then just wanting to make sure that, um, that we got it right, that we got the components right and that we are presenting the best possible game. You know, I oftentimes think about that Miyamoto quote and I don't remember the exact wording, but essentially like a, a, a delayed game is eventually good and, uh, and, and a bad game is, is bad forever. And so you certainly want to keep that in mind when you're, when you're working on any type of media. And certainly it's true with a print-based media where there are no take backs, where there's no day one patches, uh, where there are no updates. And so if that means that you have to slow the process down to get it right, then that's the right call. I mean, it's it won't be the right call for everyone. There will always be folks that are like, "Damn it, give me my game," and I get it. I get it, man. I I've, I I have thought that many a times with games that I'm super hype about. It's like, just give me the game already. Stop delaying it. And at the same time, I um, I understand. I understand why it happens, and I think it's necessary. And I would much rather have to sort of like face the music and have that hard conversation and, you know, take the slings and arrows of, of upset backers and customers that things have um, not gone as quickly as expected. If it ultimately means that we're going to give them a good product in the end, because the last thing you want to do is produce a cyberpunk, right? I mean, yeah, you, you don't want to be cyberpunk. Um, and, and I keep that in the forefront of my mind now, especially after that, after the whole debacle of cyberpunk, uh, at the end of last year. And so now I've always, ad you know, adhered to the notion of let's make sure the game is right. And if that means we've got to take a little bit longer than expected or a lot of bit longer than expected, then that's what needs to happen to make sure that people are getting the game they paid for. Cool. Um, 
but then when cyberpunk happens it just it, it brought in the focus it brought it all into focus even more of like yeah no that this is what happens when you just push shit out the door and i feel bad for that development team i mean uh, on the video game side of things um development crunch is real and it's awful and people work their asses off um to ultimately be you know uh the ones on the front lines taking all the hate online when it was people higher up than them disconnected from the actual work who were making these decisions about pushing out this product that clearly wasn't ready and that the development team was saying we're not ready to push out. And so I never want to be the, I never want to, you know, be in those types of situations. So that's why we decided to partner with them. All right. So that's it for the questions. We've got some updates now. Let's talk about project updates. So first and foremost, the most exciting update, is Wild Hunt Festival gets picked up and put on a ship the 13th. That is Saturday. So this Saturday, it gets loaded up onto the uh, the cargo ship and off it goes. So we have literally never been closer to getting Wild Hunt Festival in your hands. Obviously, we've never been closer. Um, but this is really exciting because this is something we've been, you know, we've been waiting on now for a long time. And it's exciting to finally be at a point where, um, you know, the game is the game is soon going to be upon us, and which means people are finally going to get to play it. Which means we get to talk about it and dig into it more. Yes, uh, Sai in the chat said, "I know someone who is going to be very happy on Discord." Yes, uh, we are thinking of the same thing. Um, and so, it's it's a sigh of relief to know that that is done now, because as I've talked about, you you've there are two places, there are many places, but there are two primary places where things can go awry when it comes to board game production. One is in production itself, making sure that the components look the exact way you want them to. That's always like the biggest hurdle to overcome. Once you've, over, once you've overcome that, any other hurdles that you've got to overcome are significant, significantly easier, but they are still hurdles. And one of the other hurdles outside of that one is making sure shit gets picked up. Uh, you never know when that's going to happen. You can never get a straight answer from anyone either when it comes to when your freight shipment is going to be picked up. I mean, it's like a guessing game. You would think that there would be a very clear, concise, accurate way to predict this type of thing. It's because if you think about it just logistically, it's quite easy. You put in an order. You have your final invoice with all your SKUs, with all of your your product count, you send it to one company. They say, okay, we will schedule pickup for this date. Boom, should be done. Never works that way. Never works that way. And if it does work that way for you, you got lucky because that is the exception and not the rule. So once you overcome all of the potential production hiccups and making sure you're getting the game just right in the way that you pictured it, you then have to overcome the game actually getting picked up from there, it's pretty easy. If you are partnering with a fulfillment company, if you are, um, if you're doing shipment yourself, then, then you've got another set of hurdles and obstacles to try to overcome, and that can get messy as well. But if you're working with a fulfillment company like we are, from here on out, it's easy because they take over from here. They do their thing. This is what they do every day. They know exactly what they're doing, and so you can. I can sleep sound at night knowing that, all right, the worst is now over. Now, I, I, my, the games still have to get picked up on the 13th, so I won't be able to uh, breathe easily until I get the email from our printer saying, all right, they've been picked up. Um, but once that happens, then, you know, the worst is over, and, you know, we're on cruise control the rest of the way because it's easy from there on out. So that's the big Wild Hunt Festival update there. Uh, another update, which I actually wasn't planning on talking about tonight, but I figure, hey, we're talking about Wild Hunt Festival news, and it's all good news, so let's share this. We have been talking uh, with a company about making an official an official digital adaptation of Wild Hunt Festival. Now, this this will not happen quickly, and we are still very much so in the talking phase of this process, but it is something that I've wanted to pursue for quite a while, and the opportunity sort of came knocking, and I wanted to make sure that I grabbed that opportunity while it was presenting itself. 
It's not a done deal. It's far, far, far from being a done deal. And things may fall through. I don't know. But talks are happening, out, and I would love for these talks to bear fruit and for something tangible to come from it. I'm hopeful. I don't know what that timeline would look like. Uh, but it is something that we are actively pursuing. Now, we're not pouring and funneling tons of resources into that. Again, the opportunity had to be just right, and it seems like the opportunity is just right for this kind of thing. I refuse to be one of those board game companies that gets you know, bogged down in, in trying to make the jump to digital adaptations. Plenty of companies um, do it just fine. And the companies that end up getting bogged down, they, they always got the best intentions. It's not like, you know, it's their fault or whatever. Things just don't pan out. So if it looks like that's going to happen and it's going to get in the way of, a, of, of our core mission, which is publishing board games and not digital adaptations of board games, if it looks like it's going to get in the way of that mission, then I'm not going to follow through on it. But if it looks like, hey, this, this can happen and not get in the way of what we're doing, then yeah, I, I think that's, that's worth uh, further exploring. So there's some Mod Hunt Festival news for you. Uh, some not so good some not so good news is a gun and gun update. Not like it's terrible news, but the I just don't have a lot of news, which is not the news that I want to be able to share. Um, we still haven't received the digital samples. We did get um, we did get some communication from the printer about the sleeves. So I know that they're working on it. I know that Gun and Gun is actively on their docket of things to do uh, because they asked for feedback about something. And so movement is happening, but movement is not happening super fast. I expected to have, I expected, and I still expect though, I'm not holding my breath to get an email saying that physical proofs have been shipped out to me. I was told that that would happen at the end of this week, but I was also told that the the digital samples would get to me before that happened. And here we are Wednesday evening of the week when I thought the physical proofs were going to be sent out. And I still don't even have the digital proofs, which were supposed to come before, and dare I say long before the physical proofs were sent out. So I'm a little concerned there. Um, I don't know what is slowed, what is slowing down this particular printer. They have a good reputation. We used them for Sinome. They were very responsive, very great to work with. That's why I went back to them for, for Gun and Gun. And it has not been the greatest experience. But this is part of the game, unfortunately. Um, this is part of what you deal with when you're a publisher, is you are at the mercy of other people's timelines and other people's priorities. And this is one of those cases where I can't move the ball any further or faster down the court because the ball is not in my hands right now. It is in the hands of the printer. So not like horrible news, but just not much news to share, which to me by default is not good news. So, uh, all right, some more, some more updates. So Embryo Machine, uh, the pledge manager is now open. All invites have gone out. I double checked, they've all been sent. So if you haven't checked your inbox and you backed Embryo Machine, make sure you check your inbox from uh, from Pledge Manager. You'll, you'll be getting an email, uh, an invite from Pledge Manager to confirm your order details, add on any items you want, add on your shipping, and then um, call it a day. So the Pledge Manager is open, and that also means late pledges are open. So if you missed out on Embryo Machine and you want in on that, that 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 sweet sweet neck of goodness now's your time to do so so late pledges get you access to all the kickstarter stuff so if you missed out on the kickstarter the first time around and you're kind of kicking yourself for missing it now you've got your separate second opportunity you won't get a third so give it a shot the, the pledge manager and late pledges will be open for quite a while again we're not anticipating embryo machine getting into folks's hands until the end of the year the last month of the year. Um, so we've still got some time, which means you've got some time to confirm your details and add on anything to your order that you want. Or if uh, you didn't back it while the campaign was live, you've still got time to get that late pledge in. So that's it for Embryo Machine Testament. So I had, uh, I had there was some interesting chat. There was a, some interesting chatter happening in the Testament channel of the Discord today. And someone essentially said, you know, hey, Testament 
would be sort of the ideal game for expansion content. And my response to that is, yes, actually, Testament would be the ideal game for expansion content. You are correct. And I also said, you know, I'm, I can't confirm or say anything, but we are interested in further expanding upon the worlds of the games that we've published thus far, Testament being one of them. I mentioned in the last episode that Testament is particularly near and dear to my heart. I mean, all the games we publish are near and dear to my heart. Again, I choose games that I like, which means they're all near and dear to my heart. But Testament is especially so because it was one of the games that made me form Lion Wing in the first place. It was that game that I saw and said, I'm going to publish that game one day. Lion Wing is going to be the company that publishes that game one day. And lo and behold, you know, you fast forward uh, three year, uh, two and a half years, because I said that at the end of 2017, and then we kickstarted the game at the beginning of 2020. So two and a half years later, you know, I made that, that dream a reality. And so Testament means a lot to me. And I really like working with Curl. I like working with Manifest Destiny. Um, Simon, who works with Manifest Destiny and Japan Brand, has been excellent to work with. So anytime that I can work with that team, I definitely want to. And um, I do think that like an MMO, like an MMO RPG, Testament is the type of game that would benefit greatly from expansion content, from regular content drops. There's a lot that you can do with Testament. You know, its, it's premise is pretty straightforward. You've got heroes, you've got skills, you've got monsters, you've got bosses, and you just fight them all, right? So design-wise, it lends itself really well to being a game that you can make additional content for. The only, the only challenging part about making new content for Testament is in the skill trees of Testament. So if you were, if you were a part of the Testament campaign, then you probably saw this comment like one million times, and that is, hey, can we get more skills than the 42 that come in the game? And my answer was always, no, you sure can't. Um, and that's because the game has been specifically designed and balanced around those 42 skills. And although it sounds like, well, it should be pretty easy just to add new skills to the game, right? Um, the truth is, is it's not. So much of the game has been balanced around those 42 skills. And because of how the skill tree works and then how the skills interact with the characters, it is deceptively hard to implement new skills in the game. It's quite easy to implement new characters in the game. I mean, we did that. We implemented two new characters, uh, Riordan and uh, Lulana. It's pretty easy to implement new mobs, uh, which are the smaller monsters that you fight and that, get, that the boss spawns. And it's pretty easy to design new bosses. Those three things, characters, mobs, and bosses, are quite easy, which is great because those are the three of the four components in that game. But it gets much trickier when you've got to get in and dig into the skills. So if we ever did an expansion for Testament, it would probably look like one of these two options. The first option would be the expansion includes those three things that are very easy to design for. New bosses, let's say you either got to have two or four because, you know, your boards, you know, a boss occupies each side of the board. So... You'd either have two or four new bosses. I mean, I guess you could have six, but I don't know if that's overkill for an expansion. Um, you could have a bunch of new mob cards and, uh, you know, anywhere in the ballpark of 25 to 50 new mobs, new mob cards. And you could introduce, I would want to introduce probably four new characters which would take the total to 10 characters in Testament. And then maybe we would create a fourth level of skills because there are three levels of skills in Testament right now. There's skill level one, skill level two, skill level three. This option that I just talked about would have all of that stuff there. And instead of introducing new skills, would introduce sort of a fourth level of skills which would build upon the skills that already exist because it would be much easier to design the, the, 
the new content around that. And and I would I would want, though I can't promise that it would be nice to have that fourth level, those new skills, to be able to be used in the core game as well. So that's option number one. And that would allow the core game and the expansion content to sort of be played as one, which is always my preference, just like my own gaming preference. But I also know that that is not always the way things work out, and that may not always be um, a realistic possibility, which is why I would also consider option two. And that is a completely separate, uh, non-integratable expansion where you would not be able to carry over anything from the core game to the expansion. This would, this would require, um, yes, new bosses, new mobs, new characters, but then it would require all new skills from the ground up. Three levels of skills per each character, which would require a lot more design time. It would require a lot more QA, and it would require a shit ton of money. So Testament was one of the few Manifest Destiny games that got a Japanese-only release that actually was published by Arclight. Most of the time, Manifest Destiny games are self-published. But Testament was so expensive, such an expensive endeavor, expensive to print and expensive to, to produce because there's so much high-quality art, that another company had to come in and, and help you know get that game across the finish line because it was so pricey. And I definitely don't want to run into a situation where we've got like a money pit of a project where you're just throwing money at it. You know, that's not good business practice. Not to mention, you know, you've got all those other things that you have to design around and then QA the shit out of, which you don't do quickly. If you want to produce a quality game, you don't do that stuff quickly. And so that would push Testament way out into the future. And at that point, it's kind of like, would anyone even want to, would, would anyone even remember Testament? Would they want to return to Testament? That being said, it's still an option. I would still keep that on the table if we wanted to pursue further Testament stuff. But I'm much more like option number one. It's not as glamorous because you don't get a bunch of new skills, but you still do get new skills and you get new characters and you get new mobs, and you get new bosses, and that's the essence of Testament anyway. Sure, you would utilize, you know, some or a lot of the same skills that we that you would be using in the core game, and so it wouldn't be as flashy, but it would serve its purpose, and it would give folks a lot more content, and it would be fun, and it would also allow me to talk more about Testament's lore. Now, someone in the chat said, for those who missed out on the Testament Kickstarter, is there a way to get a copy? Yeah, so you'll be able to get a copy through Japanime's, um, through Japanime's website. Actually, I think they're still allowing late pledges, to be honest. Um, and so you could bump over to their website now, and uh, I think you could get in on it. And, and I, would, I would definitely suggest doing so. Um, so. So that's... That's what I would probably do with Testament. I would love to um, I'd love to do that just because I love playing Testament. Testament is the, the board game version of an MMORPG. And more specifically, it's the board game version of Final Fantasy XIV. It really is. I mean, that was his main inspiration. You can see it all throughout the game. You can see it in the art. You can see it in the mechanics. You can see it in the classes. You can see it in the names of monsters. You can, I mean, it permeates that game from top to bottom, which I love because I love XIV. Um, and so I would love to be able to do, do more with that that universe do more with that game it had 1500 backers you know it was no slouch on kickstarter uh like 90 grand and then whatever we made in the in, you know in the post kickstarter stuff so there's a market for it people want to play it it's near and dear to my heart as i said and i really want an opportunity to further explore the lore uh, i really do you know um Initially, there was, like, no lore in that game. You just had, like, the little blurbs about the characters, uh, which were about uh, about four sentences, four or five sentences, maybe six at most, depending on the character. And then you had probably a six-sentence story synopsis that sets up why you're going into this place and fighting these monsters, and that was it. And that's pretty typical of Kuro. He likes to set the stage with lore, but he doesn't really like to do much else with it. That's not his thing. He just wants to design games. And so, you know, I said to him early on in the, in the localization process, of like, hey, do you care if we, like, expanded on this stuff? I really think this universe is, is worth fleshing out. 
I think people would enjoy that. I think a lot of people are coming to this game because it's like Final Fantasy 14. And if if a lot of people are coming to this game because they like Final Fantasy 14, that means they like a good story and they like lots of lore. I happen to be coming from Final Fantasy 14. I happen to like a good story. I happen to like lots of lore. I want to do more lore stuff. Are you cool with that? And Kuro was like, yep, go for it. <laughs> do whatever you want. Um, and so I said, all righty, sir, I will do just that. And so um, in future in future episodes of Lion Wing Talks, I actually want to explore the lore a little bit, kind of go into the background because I've written so much of the lore. I want to I want to talk about it, especially because Testament's going to be in people's hands very soon. And so it's a perfect time to kind of dig into that world a little bit, especially if I want to do something with Testament in the future. Um, and in fact, I want to do the same thing for Wild Hunt Festival since that's going to be in folks' hands as well. And I was heavily involved in that lore too. Um, now, my involvement in Wild Hunt Festival's lore was very different than my involvement in Testament's lore. So I think I sort of erroneously called myself the lore keeper uh, on Testament a couple episodes ago. And really, yes, I, I guess I am in a sense the lore keeper on Testament's lore, but really I'm the lore writer <laughs> on Testament's lore, whereas I'm a little bit more of the lore keeper on Wild Hunt Festival because I'm not writing any of that lore. Ramosan of, Wild, uh, you know, of Liner Note, who designed uh, Wild Hunt Festival, has a very specific vision and a very fleshed out world already for Gradia. And uh, I mean, they're on, they've released three games in the Wild Hunt Festival world and each game has a story to it, a story element. And so this is Ramos baby and we just localize his stuff. And I'll, I, I'll expand on things that I think need to be expanded upon for the new audience, for the English audience. And so I'll, I'll add a little bit to the lore, but Ramosan always checks it. He always okays it. It wasn't like one of those situations like with Kuro where Kuro's like, yeah, do whatever you want. Ramosan's like, hey, this is my thing. I, I love I love the, the the story of this game just as much as I love the game. Um, so this lore is going to belong to me. Uh, so it fell to me for Wild Hunt Festival to learn the lore, memorize the lore, and utilize that, that information to be able to craft the prose from the localized text to ensure that all of the information was clearly presented to the player, both in terms of like gameplay ob objectives, uh, character development, and then uh, story development. So it was much more like a lore keeper for Wild Hunt Festival and a lore writer, and therefore a lore keeper on Testament. I meant I'm a lore keeper on Wild Hunt Festival and a lore writer on Testament if I said that backward. So um, nevertheless, I want to dig into this stuff more. I really do. And uh, that goes for, for Wild Hunt Festival. You know, I talked about wanting to do more with Testament, um, but I also want to do more with Wild Hunt Festival. So does Ramasan, obviously. This is his baby. Like, the Karadia series is his thing. And he wants to do more with it. He's acted. Yeah, he wants to do more with it. And we want to we wanna partner with him to do more with it. So both of those things I want to dig into uh, further in Lion Wing Talks episodes, uh, also with Kickstarter updates. I probably won't go into it as much in Kickstarter updates just because I don't know, you know, I don't know how many like backers really care about that lore stuff. Hell, I don't know how many of you actually care about the lore stuff in this, in this Lion Wing Talks, but the Lion Wing Talks stuff is a lot looser. And so I want to dig into that stuff and um, talk about things that you would not know about the lore of Testament just by reading its manual. All right. So that's project updates uh Sai just said uh just late pledged thank you that's awesome uh i i don't think you'll be disappointed so um much appreciated so lastly i am looking for some community leads uh this has nothing to do with specific projects but talking more about the community in general i'm looking for some community leads on certain games uh point people if you will um, for many of our games. Folks who have special designations in the Discord, folks who can answer questions about the games, especially once the games get into people's hands, people are inevitably going to have questions about it. Um, people who will join me on some of these Lion Wing Talks episodes as guests to talk about the game. Maybe it's to talk about uh, 
um, competitive play and something like embryo or gun and gun or maybe it's you want to come on and you talk you want to talk meta stuff as it pertains to gun and gun or embryo or maybe you want to be more involved in Wild Hunt Festival and Testament and you want to be a point person for that. Maybe a, as a community lead, you want to be someone who streams for us, especially with our solo games. So like with Wild Hunt Festival, with Testament, maybe you want to stream some. You could do all those things as a community lead. And we'd also give you special perks as well. Free stuff. It's always good. Free games that kind of thing, uh, free merch. Uh, but we're, we're really looking for some help there. I want to uh, grow the community. I've always said community has been uh, one of my uh, key objectives for Lion Wing is, yeah, I want to produce cool shit. I want games that people like. And I also want a community where people feel welcomed and where people have fun and engage in good conversation and meet like-minded people or meet people that are not like them um, that they then can learn from and I've already seen a lot of that stuff happening in the Discord. You know, today we were talking about the subscription model stuff, and people had vastly different opinions on it. And it's not like anyone got shitty with the other person. Like, I think some people in that chat were diametrically opposed to one another. And yet it was a very, like, constructive, positive, courteous conversation. No one got attacked or anything. And I can see that kind of conversation going in that direction in other communities, in other spaces around uh, the dark recesses of the internet, but it didn't happen here. And so I, I really want the Lion Wing community to be inclusive and welcoming and warm and fun. And to help do that, I am going to need some help um, in having some designated folks, um, you know, a part of the community and helping drive the community. And um, if that is one of, if, if that is you, if that, if you fit that description and you want to do that kind of thing, I'm not, I'm not going to ask too much of you uh, because, again, you know, you get free stuff, you get access to free stuff, but it's not like this is a, uh, you know, a, a paid position. So it's not like I'm going to be asking you too much. Uh, I'm not going to be asking too much of you. Uh, but I would like for folks to be present and to be a part of developing that community. I know there are people who ask questions all the time in the, in the Discord, and I try to answer as many questions as I can, but I don't get to all of them. And it'd be nice uh, for those questions to, to get answered in those instances where I don't answer them. And it'd be great to have another, you know, to have a, a guest host on here. I've, I've streamed with a couple folks in the past. Tyler, who worked on uh, Embryo Machines localization. Winona, who worked on the localization of Gun and Gun. I want to continue doing that. I'd love to have more folks on here. And if you want to do that kind of thing, hit me up, drop me a message, drop me a DM uh, on social, drop me a DM um, in the Discord. Just reach out to me. I know uh, at least one of the person has done that. A couple people have done that actually when talking about the Line Wing Virtual League and helping get that off the ground. So thank you to those few folks who have been having those conversations. I haven't been uh, super involved in those conversations just yet as I've been trying to get all this other stuff taken care of, but with Gun and Gun and therefore Embryo fast approaching and getting into people's hands, uh, I do wanna get that kind of thing off the ground. So uh, there'll be more conversation about the Virtual League in future Lion Wing Talks episodes. And in the Discord, we uh, have been talking about the Virtual League openly in the Virtual League channel. And so if you kind of want to hear what's happening, what ideas we're kicking around, if you have ideas yourself, jump in the channel, listen, observe, or offer your feedback. Uh, I love that kind of thing. So, well, I think that about does it for today's episode. Uh, another long one, another round of great questions and some some project updates, as well as a look into the future of what I'm looking to do with Line Wing Talks, as well as just Line Wing in general. Hopefully you've enjoyed the episode. We'll be back again this time next week on Twitch, 9 p.m. EST. If you don't catch it live, you can always catch us on playback on YouTube. Um, trying to upload our stuff to Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and the Bod the Podbean app as much as possible. I'm a little behind on those just because you would think that converting to a podcast format would be pretty easy, like the click of a button, and that simply is not the case. And so it's taking a little bit more time, and I've just been consumed with projects, uh, you know, projects that we're working on fulfilling as well as, well as the project uh, that, we're that we're preparing for our uh, summer Kickstarter. And also 
uh, some various other projects. I think I mentioned in a previous episode that we're working on several projects at one time. Um, uh, we're working on a lot of projects right now. And so, uh, so yeah, um, hopefully you've enjoyed the episode and we'll do it again next week. Same time, same place. Drop your questions for me in the, uh, in the discord chat. If you have questions you want me to answer on air and until then we will see you next time. <laughs>